Hi, thank you for tuning in to The Shorts Text. My name is Lisa Quintero and I'm the Young Adult Librarian. I am Nick Barron. I am a patron and a sometimes volunteer. This is a show where we talk to you about what we've been reading, listening to, or watching. And on this episode, we're going to be talking about movies. Library news. So there's not much new going on at the library. We opened up, as some of you know, on the 15th to in-person visits. And we are still doing curbside pickup for those who can't come into the library. When uh, you do come into the library, we still are doing the one-hour computer limit. And... We are asking people to social distance. So yeah, overall, it's been going well since since we opened to the public again. And we are also doing summer reading. So for those of you who haven't signed up yet, make sure to sign up. You can either sign up online via our website, or you can come in and sign up in person. And you have the option of doing the program online, on paper, or a combination of both. Uh, we are encouraging people to do a combination of both if they can, since we don't exactly know what's going on with COVID-19 and whether, you know, there will be a spike in the future or not. And that way, if there was, you'd be able to switch easily to the online version. But we understand that some people prefer one over the others. From the stacks. So this week, like I said, we're going to be talking about movies. And we are actually mostly talking about comedies, with the exception of one movie that was a documentary. So hopefully, if you are into comedies, you will find something here that you like. Some of them are dark comedies, some of them are satirical comedies, some of them are indie comedies uh, that are a little less funny and more bittersweet. And we even have, you know, the romantic comedy making fun of romantic comedies. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 we cover the breadth of comedies. So Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the first one that we'll be talking about is Jojo Rabbit, which came out in 2019. It was directed by Taika Waititi, and it is based on the book Caging Skies by Christine Lunens. Jojo Rabbit is a kind of like a satirical comedy about this boy who doesn't have many friends named Jojo, who lives with his mom, played by Scarlett Johansson. And Jojo is a member of the Hitler Youth during World War II, and he is very into being a Nazi, and his imaginary friend is actually Adolf Hitler. And then uh, as the movie progresses, we find out that his mom is actually harboring a Jewish person in their home. And so he finds out and has to deal with how that affects his life and his viewpoint of, you know, what he's been taught in terms of Jewish people by the Hitler youth and um, the reality of this girl living in his wall. Yeah, it's when the movie started. I didn't know what to make of it because it, it it's a dark comedy, and I, I really didn't know what direction it was going to go in. And when JoJo is, he ends up getting getting sent home from the Hitler Youth camp or the training or whatever. Mm -hmm. He he's, he's sent home because he's not very good at what he does. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, they, they expect him to be to be more violent. Like there's a scene. Uh, where he's supposed to kill a rabbit, and that's how he gets the nickname Jojo Rabbit, because he's unable to do it, and one of the older boys does it, and then he ends up running off crying, because it's not something that he's he's capable of doing. Yep. So, he ends up being being sent home from Cap, and discovers that there is a, uh, a girl hiding in his house, um, a Jewish girl. And at first, he is very like malevolent towards her, um, and has has you know all of these preconceived notions based upon what he was taught about what what Jewish people were supposed to be like. And you know, he ends up over time because he's spending so much time with this girl, and uh, he's interviewing her in order to. He's writing a book on on all the things that. Jewish people are. And she's like feeding him all of these like ridiculous ideas. Like of, that Jewish people hang from the ceiling upside down and suck yeah, people's like blood. Yeah. <laughs> so so he, uh, he's compiling compiling this book and interviewing this girl. And over time, um, he of course develops a friendship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't really sure what to, what to expect from that movie because I didn't really know much about it going into it. But I, I enjoyed it. It was it was very different, and at first, when it first started, I was like, this is strange, especially because it's, it's kind of surrealistic, you know, his um, friendship with his imaginary friend Hitler, because we actually see Hitler, and Hitler's actually played by the director, Taika Waititi, uh, and the scenes with the two of them are kind of slapstick, I guess. Um, slapstick, very kind of uncomfortable. Yes. <laughs> because it is it is a child talking to his childhood friend and his or his imaginary friend and his imaginary friend is Hitler. Yeah. So, you know, it is supposed to be like a child's view of what Hitler must be like. Mm -hmm. Um 
And that was an interesting thing about the film overall is that, you know, it kind of was the child's view of what was going on in general with the war and and with the Jews and with with the Hitler youth and everything because it's all it's all basically told from Jojo's viewpoint. And he's probably what like a 11, 12 year old boy, and so it was very interesting and and different. And I I didn't think I was gonna enjoy it when I started watching it because like I said, it's kind of weird at the beginning, but once you get into it and and like wrap your mind around like okay, we we are seeing this through the eyes of a 12 year old boy um it starts to to make more sense and also as you as the story develops and you meet the other characters it also kind of changes your perception of jojo and changes your perception of of what's going on yeah and one of the things that that i liked about it is that it you know unlike old you know like 80s comedies like naked gun or whatever the characters do have arcs uh you you find out that you know one of one of the uh the, the Nazis that was like really hard on him when he was in camp actually like did something to protect him. And there's, there's a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more depth to, to it. Additionally, uh, it goes through moments of being, you know, very comedic and slapstick to actually having a degree of emotional depth. There's really sad moments and really triumphant moments, but also a lot of dark comedy. Yeah. All right. So, uh, going from comedy, we, we went to a documentary called Free Solo. Free Solo uh, came out in 2018. It is about uh, Free Solo climber Alex Hunold and his journey to uh, climb a uh, cliff face in Yosemite National Park. And it's it's called El Capitan, and it's a 900-meter vertical rock face. Um, the documentary was put together by National Geographic, and it was absolutely fascinating yeah what what were some of your some of the things that you thought were really interesting about it so i'd never heard of free soloing before and i had no idea that it was a thing um so free soloing for those who don't know is when rock climbers climb without using any sort of gear and they just use their hands so they're not using any um i don't even know the the proper terms is it the lays or like yeah, um they, 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 there's 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 no ropes no uh uh Pitons, I think they're called pythons. Okay. There's no, uh, no anything. You're just, it's just you and your chalk bag and. And you're climbing a wall. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so it was really, really fascinating to me that people actually do this and it, that there's been a culture of, of several climbers over the years. And, uh, as we find out in the documentary, many of them have died free soloing because a lot of them are, you know, adrenaline junkies and, and they keep pushing themselves to do the next big thing. And most of them have fallen to their deaths um, while doing so. And so it was really interesting because Alex, uh, the main character, the, the guy who is the free soloist, he doesn't consider himself an adrenaline junkie. But as we learn about him, we learn kind of that he has some issues with depression and with his family. And he also is just a very interesting individual who doesn't seem to have a lot of emotion, so I don't know if he's like on the spectrum or what the deal yeah, they, is there. They, um, they in the movie they made sure to like uh, to to highlight that by having him uh, take an MRI, and there is like a a section of it of his brain. Yeah, his amygdala. Yes, that it doesn't register like the dopamine response. I think it was as strongly, mm-hmm. and so he he actually in order to you know, feel something in that regard in his brain, he actually has to have like a, a heightened experience. And so it was, it was, it was really a, a really interesting, interesting thing. Um, he lives in a van or lived in a van. At that point, yeah, he lived in a van. Lived in a van. He does end up uh, like meeting somebody during the course of the of the filming that comes to one of his book signings and they end up, end up uh, fostering a relationship and they do end up getting together. And but- he talks about, you know, dating women over the years and he talks about how overall most of the women don't like what he does because of how dangerous it is, which makes sense, and how a lot of them eventually break up with him. But he meets this woman, at, like Nick said, at a book signing and, and they end up dating and ultimately they end up moving in together and so it was interesting too to see their relationship develop because on the one hand you know she tried to be supportive of him and his climbing and on the other hand you can tell that it it 
really upsets her that he needs to climb so much and at various points in the film when he's asked if he had a pick between climbing and her what he would pick he just flat out says like I would pick climbing like climbing is my life and this is what I do and either she understands that or we can't be together and so I thought that was very interesting and you know the feelings that he gets from climbing like Nick said his his brain doesn't process things the way the rest of us do so he needs this elevated sense of excitement in order to feel stuff. And, you know, it made me wonder, because he ultimately ends up doing this climb, and it made me wonder, like, okay, will he ever stop? Or is this, he just, just going to go for the next big thing and the next big thing? And, and is he going to end up like all of his predecessors and eventually, you know, die doing the thing he loves? But then the movie also brings up the question, like, if you love something that much and, and you die doing the thing you love, like, is that bad or is, you know, is it okay? And like, he seems to personally feel from the way he talks about in the movie that like, that he is reconciled with the fact that that is probably how he's going to die. And mm-hmm. he's okay with that. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. And a, a couple other interesting notes. Uh, one part of the reason why this, why they documented this and why it was significant is because no one had ever climbed El Capitan uh, mm-hmm. free solo. And it was interesting watching the process because he actually climbed El Capitan with ropes multiple times mm-hmm. in order to figure out what his path, um, cause there are, there are like known paths in order to, uh, get up different mountain, different mountains and cliff faces and what have you. But, uh, he had to figure out, you know, how, what, what route was he going to take and what, how was he going to grab certain things? And he kept detailed notes. Okay, at this point, I need to do this. At this point, I need to do this. It's it's fascinating because part of this 900 meter climb, he had to like go up and then go back down a ways and then go back up again because of the the route that he needed to take in order to be able to have the handholds and things that he needed to to make this climb. It was a fascinating movie. Um, yeah, and then he had to like memorize memorize all of his notes so that when he actually was climbing since he can't look at his notes you know to know like okay this is my handhold this is where i put my foot this is where i do this and in the process of of learning how to climb el capitan he fell a couple times and injured himself and it's amazing to watch a person you know injure themselves doing something while they're climbing something with ropes and then to be like i'm still going to free solo this and i'm going to push myself you know, at one point he injures his ankle and the doctors are like, you're probably not ready to, to do this yet. But he goes out and, and puts his, his climbing shoes on and he's like, yeah, there's pain, but, you know, I need to do this if I want to climb El Capitan. And, and so he pushes through and, and his commitment to climbing was really fascinating and honestly a little inspiring, you know. I mean, on the one hand, I felt like he was kind of nuts. And on the other hand, I thought like, this guy, you know, has this great passion for something and he's dedicated his life to it. Like Nick said, he lived in a, in a van just so that he could spend all of his time climbing and all of his resources on things that led him to climbing. And yep. so he, he eventually buys a place with his girlfriend, but yeah, no, it yeah. was, it was, it was great. And I, I highly recommend it. Um, if you are into documentaries. Yeah. Yeah. And. It's it's just magical watching somebody follow their passions. So, yeah. yep. uh, so another movie that we watched was this 2019 film called Booksmart, which is a buddy comedy written by a team of women and directed by Olivia Wilde. And it is about Amy and Molly, who are two best friends who are seniors in high school, and they are about to graduate, and they find out that they go to this you know school where there's all these kids who they think are slackers, and they're both going to Ivy League schools. You know, one of them's going to, I think... Going to be going to. Yeah, one of them's going to be going to Yale, and one of them, I can't remember what... It's Columbia Columbia or something. or something. Yeah, yeah. And so they're both these girls who are very dedicated to their studies and spent all their time doing, like, debate and student government and all these different things, and they're, they're, their life was school. And, like, the last week or so of school, they find out that their classmates are also going to Ivy League schools, and they didn't know that at first because their school has this policy of uh, the students can't tell each other where they're going to go to school in the fall because they don't want to create this sense of, like, competition and, and, you know, people feeling bad about where they got accepted or didn't get accepted to. But it comes out in a conversation that they have at one point when one of the girls is kind of 
being um, bullied in the bathroom, like not bullied, like there, there's no, she, yes, they're, you think they're, yeah, they're, they're, they're talking just, badly about her. Yeah. while she, they didn't know that she it's, was in the bathroom. In the bathroom, she's like the student body president, and they don't know that she was in the bathroom. But these kids in the are in the bathroom and talking badly about her, and she comes out of the the stall and and you know confronts them and ends up getting in this conversation and being like, well, I'm going to Yale next year, so good luck, you know, with your life. And one of the people who was saying things about her is like, oh, well, I'll see you there because I'm also going too. And this is a girl who she thinks is, you know, dumb and doesn't care about school at all. And then there's these two boys that are also in the in the bathroom and one of them's like, I got hired by Google, and the other one's, you know, also going to some prestigious college, and both of them are like skater stoner kids, and so this girl is horrified and goes to her friend and tells her, we need to, like, party and we need to do something before we actually graduate in a few days because we can't say that we spent our entire high school years just doing school stuff. All these other kids, you know, have been partying this whole time and doing fun things and they all still got into the same schools that we did and it was all for nothing so we need to fix this yeah so they they, they end up finding out uh one, one of them i think gets invited to a party mm -hmm. and it's like the party of the school year type of deal yeah. and most of most of the movie is their journey trying to get to this party um and the the, the one is in, in this dynamic, there's the one who's like, no, we have to do this. And the other one's like, eh, whatever, you know, we could just stay home. And there's that dynamic of their relationship where the one person felt like the other person had, you know, like dictated their entire like high school career and mm -hmm. they... They didn't want to, you know, follow them into into the into the darkness mm -hmm. um, in this particular p particular instance. In fact, it ends up the one thought they were both going to the same school, and then it comes out that she's actually not going to the same. Yeah, she's school. going to Africa for like a year to yeah. to work on on some stuff in Africa. So let's let's talk about the things that made this movie unique. So the one thing that made it unique to me was, like I said, it's it's entirely written by women and directed by a woman, and so it had a very you know female-centric perspective, which was cool because I feel like a lot of buddy comedies are about guys. Yeah. Um, and this is one of the the few that I've seen that's about girls and high school girls in particular. Um, and it was cool because a lot of times like high school girl movies portray women in, in certain ways that aren't necessarily true, whereas this felt more, more authentic. One of the characters, I believe it was Amy, is actually a lesbian and Molly is straight and like, you know, neither of them have really dated or, or gone out with boys. And so, but they like both are like egg each other on and, and are trying to get each other to make out with somebody or have some sort of experience with somebody before they graduate. And I felt like that was very true to teenagehood, especially as a young woman. Like, I remember having some of those conversations with friends because sometimes when you're like the bookish girl, that's kind of your life, you know, you don't, you don't date, you don't do all these things because you're so involved in your studies. And yeah. so, and their ideas about, you know, what everything would be like, don't match up with reality, like whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I thought that was really interesting. Uh, I also really liked the, the way it portrayed the dynamic between, between girls. Cause I, I do think that a lot of girls, especially in high school, um, a lot of us form these relationships where, one of us is the leader and the rest of the girls kind of follow. And I don't know if that's true for guys. Is that true for guys? Yeah. Okay. It's because I'm not, you know, I don't know. I'm not, I was never a teenage boy. So. Every, every, I feel like every social circle has a hub. Uh -huh. the, the, they're not necessarily the leader, but they're the person that everybody revolves around. Uh -huh. um, and then at various points, you know, somebody in the group may become a new hub. And that's usually a, a you know, subgroup of people that, revolve around that group like a, a, a tertiary group oh. that when when they expand the circles but, yeah uh, but yeah i don't yeah. know like if, if guys like would react or do the same things that these girls did in this movie because it's like like i said i'm not a guy but i know like i felt that the friendship was very authentic because they get into this huge fight and they end up like crying and like not talking to each other and 
and like it it turns into this big emotional thing and it's partially because Amy was trying to separate herself and, and assert her independence by going to Africa and Molly didn't know about that and Amy tells her about it but Amy didn't tell her about it initially because she was worried about Molly's feelings and that's kind of you know how female friendships are we, we we're socialized to worry a lot about other people's feelings and and to not rock the boat too much at least I was and so I thought it was really interesting how that whole drama exploded yeah. and then ultimately how they find their way back to each other and you know in my experience like that that's kind of what happened like sometimes you know you your your friends from high school sometimes you have that argument that big fight where you are like you're this and you're that and and it's irreparable and sometimes you have a fight like that and you can fix it and one of the great things about this movie is that at the end a lot of times too with high school friendships we don't know how long we're going to be friends with these people and you feel like you know you're going to be friends forever but the end of the movie is kind of bittersweet because the girls like are going their separate ways and they know that there's the possibility that they're not going to see each other as much and maybe they won't be friends again you know because i mean they're, they're trying to be friends but maybe you know, they'll end up going their separate ways because of life. Mm -hmm. And I I really enjoyed that. Yeah. What did you think was uh, different from, from stuff that you've watched? Well, I, I, pretty much all the things that, that you just detailed, you know, it was, it was like watching a movie like Superbad without all of the grossness. Because mm -hmm. I, I think that, unfortunately, most movies that document the the coming of age of young men usually revolves around some sort of terrible s cliche storyline where one of the young men or all the young men are trying to get somebody drunk in order to score mm -hmm. um and uh yeah it it didn't it was as funny as a movie like super bad without the grossness mm -hmm. and i thought when I when I saw the previews, I was like, "Oh, this is, this looks like it could be be kind of funny." But I, I secretly expected it to be terrible, and I thought it was great. Yeah, yeah, no, I enjoyed it a lot. And their journey to the to the uh, the party is great because they encounter all these different characters. Um, and one of them is their school principal, who is an, also an Uber driver on the side, and so he ends up picking them up in his Uber, and it's like a party Uber where he's got like disco balls and like yeah. this. <laughs> stuff going on and then uh uh one of the people who also gives him a ride at one point is their favorite teacher who is played by jessica williams and that part is also great because jessica williams is like this teacher who's in her 20s who kind of hasn't like completely distanced herself from her teen years and so she drops him off at this party and she probably shouldn't go into the party but she goes into the party and is like eh. that was the only gross part was was yeah. her actually because she she ends up you know, hooking up with one, one of the students. students. And yes. that was that was gross. And I was yeah. like, I don't know about that. But yeah. <laughs> but uh, the one funny but very dark comedy aspect of the movie was that there was a there's a character that they order a pizza um, in order. I can't remember what the reason was, but they oh, because they're, they, they're trying to find where the party is. is and they, they, they know that the people at the party ordered, ordered like ten, 20 pizzas. Yes. And they're like, how many people ordered 20 pizzas tonight? Let's call this pizza place and Be see. Because they saw it on Instagram or Snapchat or one of those, like yeah, the, the, yeah. the pizzas are arriving. And so they knew, they knew uh, where the pizzas came from. And they're trying to figure out where this party is. And so they, and they up, don't know where this party is because they're not like yeah. the cool girls. And yeah. so they, they haven't like, and they don't know anybody at the party well enough because they're just each other's friends. They don't really talk to anybody else. They've never hung out with anybody else. So they are just trying to figure out where this party is because they want to be there even though neither of them was actually invited. Yeah. Um, or the one of them was, was like casually like invited. Like kind right? of invited, yeah. but not really. Yeah. So, but but anyway, so they... Not they, by the person actually throwing the yeah, party. <laughs> exactly. But, but they end up jumping into uh, the car with a pizza delivery driver and they ask him to like they get the information about where the pizzas were delivered but they also ask him to take take them there and he starts like pressing them on um you know don't you think that this is a bad idea you're way too trusting and i'm not going to spoil it but uh, yeah. that's like that character was one of the most amusing to me yeah also i really enjoyed how they like <laughs> they like try to stick him up in his car and they like they both like they both have long hair so they like flip their hair over the front of their faces and use like ponytail ties to like tie it to like 
so that only their eyes were visible, but the rest of their face is hidden by their hair. And that was just... It was, yeah, it was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. It was great. It was something that, like, a 17-year-old girl who doesn't get out much would do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah, highly recommended. So, the next movie we're going to talk about is one that, with the world being what it's like in 2020, uh, Lisa's like, did you ever see Idiocracy? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I, I tried to watch it, you know, in like 2007 or something like that, but uh, I ended up falling asleep and, because I found it kind of annoying. But uh, it came out in 2006. It was directed by Mike Judge, uh, who also wrote and directed Office Space, as well as known for Beavis and Butthead and King of the Hill. Luke Wilson is the main character, and then Maya Rudolph and Dax Shepard were both in the movie as well. So, Idiocracy... How do I even even describe it? <laughs> so it. So you uh, got to start with Luke Wilson. So he is a guy who is a soldier, and he is asked to participate in an experiment where he is going to be like cryogenically frozen for a certain amount of time, and then he will be awakened in the future. Yeah. Um, except that. He ends up like in a landfill along with his woman, who is played by Maya Rudolph, who also is part of the experiment. And she's actually in in her present day. She is a prostitute, but you know she's her pimp. Is, like basically sells her to this these science so this, people, this government program, so that she can you know make him money and, and be part of this experiment. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, so he he ar- arrives in the future, and his his. Pod. <laughs> His pod that he is frozen in uh, ends up uh, being pushed off of a uh, pile of garbage and comes crashing through the window of, of somebody's apartment. And it pops open and he, you know, has first it goes through the, the, the typical like fish out of water type story where he's trying to figure out where he is and what has happened. But the important thing about this partic- particular movie is that it's not so much the story as it is a lot of the like satire that goes along with it where it's it's looking at where we are headed as a people uh so the and also the, where we were as a people in 2006 and where I we mean, were as a, that's where, yeah. that when it was made but yeah so yeah so the some of the pros and cons in this you know bit of satire it there's Reality television is gotten even more ridiculous and dumb. Uh, when he crashes into this guy's apartment, you know, he's the guy that's in the apartment is basically watching endless amounts of really bad reality TV. All of their language has been dumbed down. His, his couch is like also a toilet. <laughs> yes, yes, his couch is also a toilet. Um, because, you know, you don't want to have to get up from the couch. And it has some sort of like dispenser that dispenses like junk food. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, it, it portrays it portrays a future where we are immersed in that level of convenience where you use the use the bathroom and you know eat snacks while you're watching endless an endless dose of uh, reality TV. And then their clothing comes out of like these things that look like Kleenex boxes, and it's like shiny polyester brand <laughs> name clothing, yeah. um, and it just. It's, like, disposable, so they just can pull it out of these, like, boxes in their wall whenever they need a, a change of clothes. Yeah. Yeah, so it is a uh, a ridiculous bit of satire. I definitely, I enjoyed it more now than I did when I tried to watch it in 2007. Okay. Um, I, I didn't get, like, it was just too dumb mm-hmm. for, but... You know, I didn't realize that it was supposed to be quite so dumb. Uh-huh. Um, that's, you know, where the, the satire and the subtext comes in. You know, yeah, I- like the, the whole, like, plant thing the, in the future. Because this is, like, five centuries into the future, and these people are like dying because they don't know how to grow food. And there's like a, <laughs> there's <laughs> that, that, that was one of the, actually one of the great statements about, you know, where we think where he predicts things are going with, you know, corporations owning everything because they feed plants. This is where Lisa was going. This is they feed plants Gatorade yeah, instead except of water. It's not Gatorade. It's, <laughs> yeah. like, it's like some other, the brand name is something else, yeah. but it's basically Gatorade because it has electrolytes and they're like, everybody needs electrolytes, including plants. And, um, and then, you know, Luke Wilson comes along and he's like, plants need water. And they're like, like the stuff from the toilet? 
who needs that? And he's like, yeah, you need to drink water. And they're like, from the toilet? <laughs> you know, and these people are like obsessed with the water just belongs in the toilet and it's not something that you put on anything that you would eat or in your mouth. They're just like, we got to put Gatorade on the plants and eventually crops start growing again because water actually works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so the, there's a lot of great commentary in the movie. Uh, but at the same time, there's also like, in order to illustrate, you know, how dumbed down things are, there's some really kind of like objectionable jokes and verbiage. That, yeah, that yeah. I... it's like it's one of those comedies that in some ways has aged well and other ways has not aged well at all. It's interesting how some movies, you know, do that, how you can watch them in the time period that they come out and you're like, this is fine. And then like, here we are. What is it? 14 years later. And you're like, eh. Yeah. So, so a little bit of a mixed bag, but it, it definitely had some good commentary in it. Yeah, yeah. It's not the best movie ever, um, but it, it is interesting thinking about it in terms of, of where we are now and in terms of where we're headed, like Nick said. And if it didn't have the E moments, it would be great, but yeah. but it does. So, you know, it's... it's it's Mike Judge, so yeah. as you know, anybody who's watched Beavis and Butthead or anything like yeah. that knows the guy's not always <laughs> always very PC or anything. Yeah. So, indeed. Uh, so the next one that uh, I have on my list is Papi Chulo, which came out in 2018 and was an independent movie, just as something that I happened to, to stumble upon on our shelves at the library. And it is about a weatherman who is, at the beginning of the movie, we see him crying while giving the weather report. We don't know why he's crying. And so he gets put on this leave, this forced leave by his employer to deal with whatever it is that he's dealing with. And he he goes home and there's this spot on his deck that is a different color from the rest of his deck. And we're under the impression that his partner has broken up with him and that he, you know, is trying to redecorate his home in order to get rid of the memory of his partner. And so he, he tries to fix the spot himself. He goes to like a, a home repair store and gets some paint and some painting materials, except that the, he doesn't, quite match the paint to the paint that's already on the deck because the paint already on the deck has been like, you know, warm by the sun. So it's not. And, and he also bought like the smallest possible thing of paint because he thought, oh, I just, I only need to paint the one spot. Yeah. The little like, like circle or whatever it is. And the guy at the, at the store is like, yeah, you, you probably are going to need more paint than that. And you're going to want to match it and, and this and that. And so he goes to, <laughs> he goes home and, and tries to paint this, this circle. Um, and he starts painting it and, gets up after he's done and realizes that it's like this bright blue, whereas the rest of his deck is this very light blue. And he's like, well, now what? And so for, you know, a while, he's just kind of wallowing around. And then at one day while he's driving, he sees a bunch of uh, Latino day laborers outside of a hardware store. And so... Uh, the hardware store that he Yeah, is. the hardware store that he got his, his painting supplies at. And... He goes back, you know, and talks to the, the guy at the store about what happened. And the guy, like, he's like, I try to tell you, you know. And, and so he goes outside and talks to the day laborers and offers to hire one of them to to help him, you know, redo his deck. And so this guy, Ernesto, um, ends up getting in his car with him and they, you know, drive to his house. And Ernesto starts working, but this guy is kind of lonely and he... You know, he's been going through a lot, and so he goes out and buys Ernesto this big fancy lunch from, like, his favorite place that he used to eat at with his partner, and and tries to get Ernesto to talk to him, except Ernesto doesn't speak any English, and this guy doesn't speak uh, Spanish very well, and so their conversation is, is rudimentary at best. But ultimately, they form kind of a, a quasi-friendship over, over the several days that he has Ernesto come to his house, because he... he tries, you know, this is a project that Ernesto says is like, it'll take, you know, probably about a, a couple of days and, and yeah, a, few days. a few days and the guy, you know, kind of tries to draw it out and draws it out in these really awkward and uncomfortable ways. Like at one point he picks up Ernesto at the hardware store and makes him go on a hiking trip with him. Yeah. And Ernesto's just like, what? Like, he's like, I feel bad taking money from you for, I didn't do any work today. You know, I just hiked with you. And, and the guy's like, no, no, like, I want to pay you. Like, one of the things that hasn't been explicitly stated is that the main character is a gay man. And 
so you know he starts off the movie he has he has this breakdown but like when he goes to the hardware store he's got this this air of you know kind of like arrogance and self self importance mm -hmm. and yeah well he's like a, a TV weather person he he's well known you know? yeah and so at first he doesn't come off as as very likable and kind of kind of clueless you know there's kind of like a, a like a, a classist type dynamic um, but at the same time he's he's lonely and so when he first brings Ernesto over, you know, he's just excited to, to, to talk to this man. Um, and this guy is just here to do the work. Mm -hmm. And as, as the time goes on, and, and as Lisa said, you know, he, he starts concocting these, these like day trips and, and other things. And Ernesto, he's, he's got like a dynamic because he gets home and he explains to, explains to his wife that, Hey, I'm, I'm working for this gay man. I don't know what's happening, but he is paying me to work on his deck, but instead he's, like, buying me lunch and uh, taking me on hikes and taking me And his wife's like, be careful, I think he has a crush on you. Yes. <laughs> and so, but, and and of course, all the other day laborers, when he, he tells the other day laborers what's happening, they all kind of, like, sh shun him a little, but also shun the the main character and you know have some you know preconceived notions about him mm -hmm. and uh you know a little prejudice and so but what ends up ultimately happening is you kind of see the main character break down and ernesto has this you know has that you know epiphany of you know this is just a, a human being mm -hmm. and as the main character breaks down and er ernesto gets gets to to know him um, ultimately has this, you know, this epiphany where he ends up helping him and lifting him up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it was, it's a very touching film. And it was interesting watching them, you know, develop their friendship and, and ask each other questions and, and talk to each other with their, their rudimentary Spanish and English. It was, it was cool that, you know, these two people from the, these very different backgrounds, uh, were able to form this friendship and, and help each other out in their own way. Yeah. And so I, I enjoyed it. It was labeled as a comedy on the back. It wasn't super funny. Um, it was more sad, but it was like bittersweet, I guess. It, it had a couple of funny moments. Like like a lot of indie movies. Like uncomfortable funniness. Yeah. Like like a lot of indie movies, I feel like the comedy is kind of buried into the story mm -hmm. um, instead of just being, hey, we're here to like make you laugh. Mm -hmm. we, we're here to make you think and make you laugh. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, out of out of all of these movies, the the movie that I feel had the most depth uh, was this one. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I, I I I give it two thumbs up. I'd never heard of it before, and, and Lisa brought it home. And I was like, eh. yeah, and I never heard of any of the actors <laughs> in it or anything. Either. It, it was it was one of those movies that got kept getting pushed to the bottom <laughs> of the pile. Um, and then when we watched it, I, I I thought it was great. So it comes back to me. So. We we're not going to cover all the stinkers in the bunch. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, we watched a lot of that, a lot of ones that I'd watched several years ago. Where I was like, "Have you ever seen this?" And then I brought them home and we watched them. I'm like, "Yeah, it wasn't as good as I thought it was." You know, ten, fifteen years ago. <laughs> yeah. This movie was "Isn't It Romantic," which yes. came out in 2019, and it has Rebel Wilson in it. And it is a how 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 would you explain the story? It's like an anti-rom-com rom-com. Yes. So Rebel Wilson plays Natalie, and Natalie is very cynical about love, and she is very cynical about romantic comedies, and is like, life never goes the way that it is in romantic comedies, and she doesn't think of herself as attractive, and she doesn't think of herself as, you know, somebody who's gonna, capable of getting a man, because when she's little, her mom is like, you need to look like a supermodel in order to be able to get a man, and you're not gonna ever do that. And so she has these ideas that that's what life is and that her life is never going to be like the life of a person in a romantic comedy. And so she's just very cynical about love and is, you know, criticizing romantic comedies. And then she gets hit on the head. Yeah. <laughs> like all these, all these movies, of course, yeah. right. she gets hit on the head and she wakes up in her own romantic comedy with musical scenes and a giant closet in a fancy apartment and a boyfriend played by uh, one of the Hemsworths. And so she uh, she ends up, you know, in in this this romantic comedy version of her life. And, and she's, you know, her co-worker is, is also her friend, uh, this guy, in real life. Before she got hit on the head, you can kind of tell that he has a crush on her. 
but she doesn't know and she is kind of clueless about it. But in the in the romantic comedy version of her life, she's not interested in him. She's got this beautiful, hunky man who wants to be with her all the time and uh, a commentary a little bit on on romantic comedies because <laughs> there's a scene where Liam Hemsworth comes out of the bathroom and, and he like drops his towel and she's like, of course it's a PG-13 movie because all these movies are PG-13 movies. And so every time that he drops a towel, she doesn't actually get to see anything. Mm-hmm. She just like, the scene repeats itself where she wakes up again and then he like opens the door and is like, Hey, beautiful, or whatever, and goes to drop his towel, and then, yeah. like, and she, I, I can't remember. Oh, she, I think she, she goes, goes back to sleep, like keeps going back to sleep, yeah. so that every time she wakes up, the exact same sequence happens over, over and over again, and it, it never, she, she never gets the, the, the satisfaction of it. Yeah, yeah. Um. So, so yeah, a lot of the comedy in the movie was in it being self-aware that it was a comedy, a romantic comedy, a romantic comedy. Yeah. Uh, I there was a lot of moments in the movie where I was just just like it was just kind of like cringeworthy in this in the sense of just I don't know. I, it, it just it, it it was like the corniest cheesiest romantic comedy you could think of because yeah. it like it took all of the romantic comedy elements and like ramped them up to like one hundred. Yeah. So like I said, I mean, there's like there's musical numbers, there's all sorts of just ridiculousness you know and and in her real life like her her friend at the office is a woman and and they get along really well and then like her romantic comedy life like they're rivals and they have to like duke it out um and they're really mean to each other (laughs) and so it it was an interesting take on on that but also it was just for me it was a little too ridiculous i guess yeah Um, the 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 thing that that killed me is that i have like as dumb as I thought the movie was through most of the movie, even though I li- I liked the subtext of it, the, mm-hmm. the subtext of the storyline was good. The execution of the story was not good. <laughs> but because I have a thing for for underdog stories, as stupid as I thought this movie was, <laughs> I still cried at the end because of th- that triumphant moment of did you, you know, cry at the end? I don't remember. Yeah. This. The, the the underdog triumphing over over uh, over all. I was like, man, <laughs> You're really like, the stupid movies. <laughs> <You're> like... <laughs> Terrible. Uh, if if you like Rebel Wilson and you you want to laugh, I would say instead of watching this movie, watch Jojo Rabbit because her her appearances in Jojo Rabbit are, in my opinion, oh, are yeah, I much, forgot that she was in that. Yeah, was, she were was... much funnier. That was that was pretty funny. Also, I really like her in um, Pitch Perfect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so watch watch those. <laughs> but if you love romantic comedies and are willing to laugh at romantic comedies, check yeah. it out. As always, thank you for tuning into the Short Stacks. We hope you have enjoyed this episode. If you have any questions or comments for our hosts, email us at shortwoodstacks at gmail dot com. You can find us on Podbean, iTunes, and Spotify. Until next time. Thanks for listening, and be well. The Shorewood Stacks is produced by Lisa Quintero and Nick Barron for the Shorewood Public Library. Music on this episode is by Kevin McLeod. The song is called Ice Flow and can be found at incompetech.com.